Hey, thanks for checking out the Nikhil Hogan Show. If you like the content, you can subscribe to it on most major podcast platforms, YouTube or Facebook. I'm also writing a book on music education called Why Children Quit Music. And you can check out my website, NikhilHogan.com, for updates on when it's going to be released. If you're a parent who's interested in learning how best to help your children learn music, you can check out my company, SongbirdMusicAcademy.com. And there are a ton of free articles links and resources for Neapolitan Partimento-based learning, and also the Barry Harris Method if you're interested in learning jazz. Now, let's get to the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the show interviewing the best musicians in the world, and what a treat today. I'm so thrilled to introduce my guest, pianist, composer, arranger, and teacher, Isaac Raz. Isaac Raz holds a Bachelor of Music degree in Jazz Composition and Music Synthesis from the Berklee College of Music in Boston and is a recipient of the Duke Ellington Award. He received his Master of Arts in Teaching in Music Education from Lehman College, Bronx, New York, and is a recipient of the Joseph Delicari Fund Award. In 1993, he composed the musical score for the Emmy Award-winning documentary film Pioneer Woman. In 2000, Isaac worked with jazz record producer Teo Macero, playing keyboards and program tracks for his Impressions of Miles Davis album featuring Vernon Reed, David Liebman, Lou Soloff, and Lincoln Goines. His arranging skills have been utilized in many pop music recordings, including Zomba Records, gold-selling R&B artist Joe. Isaac continues to work as a composer, creating music for film, TV, and educational applications. His jazz and pop groups have played throughout the country and abroad, featuring his own compositions as well as popular music of all styles. In the New York City jazz scene, Isaac is an eight-year veteran of Barry Harris's weekly Tuesday workshop and a great proponent of Barry Harris's method. He's the founder of Whole Music LLC and runs a, a fast-growing YouTube channel. Isaac, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so thrilled to be able to talk to you. I'm such a fan of Barry Harris, but I want to go right to the beginning. When did you start picking up music? Um, so uh, I believe um, when I was a very young child, my parents put me on the Suzuki method. Um, and I started out, um, uh, um, you know, as a young child. And then, I, and then I, uh, I sort of quit. And then I started again when I was nine because it drew me in. And, and you know, the rest is history. Also, my, mo- uh, my mother is a, is a singer and she was um, a major figure in the Israeli uh, musical theater world, having done uh, productions of uh, My Fair Lady for the, the first uh, national theater production. Um, and and so, so I kind of grew up around vocals and musical theater and music. My father was also a music teacher before he went uh, into other careers. So it's always been around, you know. Do you have absolute or perfect pitch? No, um, you know, I, I, the jury's out for me. I know a lot of people might disagree with me, but about what is, per, you know, how do people, I don't, I don't even know if that exists or if it, it's either everybody has it or nobody has it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's interesting. It's like, well, if you have perfect pitch, is it like the Baroque A or is it the A440? What, which perfect pitch do you have? It's very interesting to, uh, to, to contemplate that, but, um, that's another that's another discussion, but uh, uh, for me, for me, uh, um, it's like if you give me a note, I'll be able to hear the others very well. Uh, but you know, and I, I don't know. I might sometimes I get it right. I have a one out of twelve chance of getting it right. I guess. <laughs> now you have gone through Berkeley College of Music, which is a very famous music college for contemporary music, jazz. And you have a degree in jazz composition. And then you studied at Lehman College to get a Master of Arts in Teaching for Music Education. And then, I guess eight years ago, you wound up in the Barry Harris Weekly Tuesday Workshop. And so tell me about that. So what was your development like in Berkeley and then Lehman College? And how did, it, how did you eventually find your way into the Barry Harris classes? Okay, so uh, I, I, when I finished high school, I kind of... I didn't really even apply to any other schools. It was like Berkeley was the Mecca. And, uh, um, and I, uh, um, I just kind of went there and sight unseen and decided, you know, I'm going to jump in whole, uh, whole hog into the, the jazz world. And then this new method that they teach it at Berkeley. And, uh, you know, and I did pretty well there. I mean, I was, a, uh, I was, um, uh, um, 
you know, I, I really stu- studied the system and I learned it, but the, but but I, I kind of always had trouble putting it together when I was when playing. You know what I mean? I was more of a writing major and a production major, but if I was if I was just sort of jamming along, I couldn't get my fingers to follow what was in my head, and uh, I, and I don't know if I was practicing it wrong, and I was and I, I just kind of really uh, always struggled with it a little bit. And are you talking about like chord scales and modes? I'm, and I'm like- talking about all of it. I'm talking about <laughs> playing. So like, yeah. I'm talking about like when 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 you would just sit down to play a tune. You know, um, all my teachers would say, "Well, okay, well, which fifth do you use? Which do you use a flat fifth? Which thirteenth do you use? Use a flat thirteenth or sharp? You know, natural thirteenth. You know, which scale is this? A Lydian with a sharp four or?" Or, or, or a mixolydian with a sharp four, or a mixolydian with a natural four. You know, there's all these this terminology, and I understood it very well, and it was a great way of teaching theory and having a, an understanding of theory. But when it came to practical playing, I always struggled with being able to find a streamlined way of actually performing it. Um, so fast forward about, you know, an inordinate amount of time, and I sort of accidentally uh, landed in Barry's class and uh, and then there was just something about the way he see see Barry um, kind of came up with his own system independently you know he's not uh, uh, saddled with traditional instruction like like some of <laughs> us he and and so he is and he's also blessed with a, a really amazing intellect to be able to take ideas and and tie them together what was your first day like in that master class so okay so when i first got there it's kind of a little chaotic you know everybody's sort of crowding around the piano it's a little like a press conference if everybody's <laughs> shoving their mics in everybody's face and you're like oh let's get this catch this i know exactly and, what and you're and talking first, about <laughs> yeah at, and, and at first i was i was a little off put by that uh, but uh but i but thanks to my then girlfriend now wife who uh who made me stay, uh, I, I saw there was this, there was this, um, I, I, I kind of caught, I, I, got, I clued in to what was really going on uh, when, I, when I got over that initial shock, you know, be, being used to a more, you know, you go to a classroom and there's a teacher and then there are people sitting and everybody's organized and, you know, this was a little chaotic, but it's actually in the chaotic nature of it is what is the effectiveness of the teaching I found because it's very, um, you know, it's very organic. You know, he comes up with ideas off the top of his head and then what happens is, you know, there's this interaction between, you know, the master who is Barry and then his more advanced students and then there's this sort of concentric circle going out uh, for the students teaching other students and everybody's in inner and and it's it's a little bit like uh those uh those renaissance paintings that you see of like socrates and all <laughs> the, the and everybody's of arguing yeah. and so, and people <laughs> have their fingers up in the air talking about i'm discussing something important and then the other teacher and then there's the teacher who's in the center that's a little bit how it's structured well, do you remember how your first interaction with him directly uh, do I remember my first interaction with him? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, it was almost nothing. I mean, uh, the, the, after, after the, the piano class that comes the vocal class and, uh, you know, I'm a singer as well. So I, I, and, and I'm pretty good at sight singing. So I was like, all right, I'm going to be first. He, he'll pick a song that nobody knows. Like <laughs> it, lately, you know, he's been asking me, I've been, uh, you know, privileged to be among the people that help him find music. So he says, Isaac, you know, get, find this song. I apologize. And I'm looking all over and, you know, well, it, that one happens to be in the Tune Dex book, but sometimes he'll break the internet. Like <laughs> there's no way of finding this song. You know, you have to, <laughs> it's on YouTube and you have to transcribe it. Anyway, Long story short, there's this song that nobody ever knows, and and uh, and I sight sing it, and I and I, I, I was technically rather good, but of course completely devoid of any soul or interpretation by his standards, and he just kind of like, yeah, that's nice, you know, but that was that was it, and then and then I, you just got to keep coming, and then after I'd say it took him two years to even remember my name, you know. <laughs> when did and what happened to that second year when he actually was aware? Uh, that you were quite serious about this. 
Well, it's um, uh, it's uh, you know, you're one of many, and and you kind of it's a little bit like what I described about the press conference. You know, you need to have good elbows to find your way to the <laughs> to the hot seat if you if you if you want to. You know, you really do need to be motivated, and then he'll see your motivation, and then he'll and then he'll engage you on that. You know, he, all he cares about is to is to pass the word, and to and to and and if if and if you're with him, he's with you. You know, and if you're not, then he's nice and he's wonderful. But 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 you could tell that he'll he'll direct his attention, his true attention to those who have invested a dedication into what he wants to teach. Let, let's set the stage for my audience then. So Barry Harris is a very famous uh, in the jazz world, a pianist, a jazz pianist. And he's known for being a part of, really a part of, just the, the recorded legacy is is vast. He's he's on a lot of records, and uh, I guess would you be would it be fair to say that he is an adherent of kind of the bebop style of jazz? Well, his uh, he, his his nom de guerre is uh, the keeper of the bebop flame. So he he really has committed his his artistic self and his teaching self to the bebop language and once in confidence he sort of you know you know he is a bit of an iconoclast and he does like to ruffle people's feathers and uh, uh and he does it's 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 almost tongue-in-cheek but uh, uh you know it's it's fun to see to see him do that you know because the person in his position but but once in confidence he kind of leaned over to me and he said look you know, Isaac, he said, I fell in love with a period and it was too short. And it was. I mean, if you really want to think about it, you're talking, what, roughly 1945 to roughly 1958. Really it depends on who you ask. Does he include hard bop in there? Well, I think that that's, if I'm not mistaken, that kind of comes after. And you might think of him as that. But no, he basically looks at the language as developed by Bud and Bird and and he's and and you know but by my understanding he he feels that that is what takes the mantle from what he calls Bach and them you know he <laughs> yeah. like you know Chopin and Liszt and basically standard practice high romantic harmonic language and uh, and he says this is this is the language. This is the fully well developed language, and it, it didn't really reach its potential before music sort of splintered off into a modernistic style, and also what he would call sort of you know, what what you might consider almost an academic, like it, it splintered off into like an academic, uh, conservatized type of practice, as opposed to the oral tradition, the way he is keeping it. And so there's a, a bit of a, you know, almost a lamenting of like what happened to the music, you know. Sometimes he tells a story. He says, you know, Beauty and Ugly went for a swim and Ugly got out of the water before Beauty did and put on all Beauty's clothes. So then Beauty had no choice but to put on all Ugly's clothes. And that's what we have today. You know, that's and, and you, you think about that story. It's kind of poignant, you know, for somebody in his position. You know, he's looking around, and, the, and it seems like the mu- the music changed around him. But he's still focused on trying to find the full potential of this language. I, I've heard some criticism where it's like he is not modern; he's part of that the '40s and '50s. But jazz has really gone forward. You know, it's not we we don't think like that anymore. Now we're talking about chord scales and the super Locrian Mixolydian Ionian flat three or whatever. You know, that's what we're talking about now. And so Barry is an anachronism in, in a way. It's very easy to think that way, but what I learned and having having studied at Berkeley in a way. Uh, and again, I don't want to knock it because it, I really learned a lot of valuable stuff. And I studied under Herb Pomeroy, who's a phenomenal uh, teacher of uh, writing and of theory. But in a way, it was almost like doing the music in reverse chronological order, starting with the modernists and working your way back. Whereas what I found rather late in the game having stumbled into Barry's class is that 
you can't play the modern stuff without a firm grounding in the traditional. And actually, what I found out even after that is they're one and the same. There's no difference. Uh, when you say chord scales, you know, chords come from scales, and that's what Barry teaches. It's all about linearity. And you want to you wanna dial the, the clock back to – that goes way back to the very origins of our Western music language it is, it is that harmony evolved out of counterpoint, uh, which is linear. And, uh, um, and, and Barry teaches it exactly the same way, uh, where, where a, a chord is just basically coming out of a scale. And so he'll teach harmony in a scalar way, and that's what makes the sound so – that's what makes it sound right. You know, that correct sound is that linear movement. And then when you want to talk about modernism and the modern sounds and the kinds of harmonic colors that the modernists add – well, Barry's language is able to describe those kinds of things so elegantly, and you can come up with some modern sounds that you wouldn't even imagine. I mean, I mean, how do you get that sound? And really, it just comes out of that basic six diminished scale or whatever it is that he's teaching with no – like like you can sound like you're playing out, quote unquote, but you're not out. You're in. And that's that's amazing. That's like – that's Jedi stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Some people have uploaded videos on YouTube where he starts. Like, I saw one really funny one where he said, music is math, and Bud and Charlie Parker were great, but they, they, there's a whole lot more music for you guys to absolutely. write. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's what I was saying about him lamenting music going into a, a different style before fully realizing the potential, um, you know, like of what you had before you had mentioned as being old school it's only old school because it went that far you can take the principles and push them further and get modern with it uh you know again yeah mathematics evolves and so this language evolves much in the same way and there's no end to math he says there's no end to math you can't put, do it all well you think bach did it all he didn't do it all there's no way he could do it all you know that's where you know and and that and that's where uh, you really see his dedication to spreading the word you know and to being a you know a, a bit of an evangelist for well, let's, the style Isaac, let's get technical now okay so let's get technical let's get, let's technical. Go. <laughs> let's get wonky yeah, let's get wonky because <laughs> if we split up his class there's a vocal class there's a piano class and there's a, a horn class right is that right well, uh, yeah, more like an improv class. So let's talk. Let's start with improv, maybe. If we wanted to get comfortable in his class, and you're a veteran of it, what are the things we need to practice and get ready? Well, um, I'll just put it in his words. He says, "This is finishing school. You need to come here knowing certain things. You know, so you need to know all of your major scales from every scale degree up and down. Uh, there's, you need to know that first of all." It has to fit in rhythm, so that implies two things. Number one, you have to pat your foot, and never pat your foot on two and four. Always pat your foot on one and three, or on all four beats if it's medium tempo. So, and he actually likes to criticize people that that tap on two and four. Now, I was taught to tap on two and four. I think by we my all teachers. were, right? <laughs> right, on two, three, four, one. But, but. And I always would get lost. And when Barry said, tap on one and three, two and four is in the heart. And so then you've got, now you've got the real feel because it's now it's funky. And now there's a beat to it. He says, you know, it's funny when he, you know, again, he's a bit of an iconoclast and he likes to ruffle feathers. He says, I can't even, you know, if you're tapping on two and four, what in the world are you clapping on? <laughs> I can't even do it. You know, he's trying to climb. I can't do it. You know, yeah, you tap on one and three, and then you never get lost if you remember to do it. If you were taught wrong, like I was, I'll forget sometimes, and I'll and I'll go back the other way, and then I'll get lost. I'll drop beats. I'll lose the timing. It's embarrassing. But if I tap on one and three, especially with fast, he calls it when you when you do fast tempos. He calls it the slow underneath. So you might be playing Cherokee, do 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 do, but you're tapping boom, 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 boom. You're tapping one and three, and you will never get lost. 
I mean, you might miss a change, you might them in, but you'll always land on your feet because you're grounded in the rhythm. And this is, of course, deeply human. Ever since we were cave people, you know, the low sounds were the feet and the high sounds were the hands. You know, you you tap. And you clap, and there's an action reaction, and that describes all of the the forward motion of music. Well, that's brilliant. Rhythm. You you brought up you brought up Cherokee. Now, if we were in Berkeley, they would say, okay, B flat major, Ionian scale, and then uh, Mixolydian. They would throw in all the modes, right, immediately to think. But how should we break up that song? Okay, so uh, so uh, to, so. So, so the way he teaches the improv class, he has this real great method of his that, that you could refer to as a scale outline. And what it basically means is you tap on one and three, you play a scale to the seventh degree, not to the eighth degree. Because when you go, if you go da 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 it doesn't sound right in the rhythm. But if you go da 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 I can actually hear Cherokee's chord progression underneath. That's what it is. So you're developing your ears, and then when you practice the scales in their place in the song like that, you now see where the roots are, where the chord tones are, where the passing tones are so clearly and instantaneously and again very importantly in rhythm because how is jazz different from the standard practice classical european music or or romantic it's there's a rhythm section and once they once you get that rhythm train going it's like a freight train it doesn't stop it just goes and you have to deal with it so how do you do that well you make sure you're grounded by tapping and then you practice the scales in their place and then what happens is you start to see the connections. You don't even know it cognitively, but somehow, even if you can get through one scale outline once on a song that you're having trouble improvising on, you'll be able to just improvise much better. And then there are other ways of permutating that. Wait, so you let's, might start let's take a quick step. So you said all the major scales, all the minor scales. So what? You minor, know all your major scales yep. from every scale degree. Okay. Well, there's your minors, right? Is minor natural minor or, or harmonic or melodic, jazz melodic? What would it be? Yes. Yes. All three. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Well, because what is, think about what the minor, uh, the, those the melodic and harmonic minor <clears throat> are modifications to, to make the minor scale fit a tonal context, to add the major seventh, the, the leading tone. And it works on the way up, but it doesn't work on the way down. And, and you know, you can just look at the Weltimber Clavier and see how Bach did it and see how those cross relations work. <laughs> Um, you know, what I do personally is I'll, I'll practice, I'll go, I'll take from every skill degree. So I'll go, you know, and then when you get to the six, you got the natural minor, but then I might do the harmonic minor on all of them. So I might go, da, 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 da. I can't do it, but you know what I'm talking about. I know about, exactly. Right? So so three minor scales. But then again, there's also his minor six and major six uh, diminished scales. What is that? Uh, that's right. Well, that's a whole thing. That goes more to the uh, the, the theory class, right? Um, and so, so, but again, everything is grounded in the theory class because that's that's the basic framework for the uh, for the entire language, what, what you'll see in the improv class to get, but just to finish the, the thought on that is that he, he's, he has his half step rules of where you put half steps in. Once you get the scale outline done, there are ways of breaking up a scale to make an interesting line, and you'll use arpeggios, you'll use chords, you'll use. Is that the bebop scale? Well, the the six diminished scale is what people call the major bop scale, which is a major scale with a half step between the fifth and the sixth. Um, and you can think of it many different ways. I mean, even Chopin used that. Barry will show in class how uh, uh, he'll use it in a, 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 a etu, Chopin etu, particular Chopin etu that uses that particular scale. And and uh, and you know, even Bach used it. They all used it because if you want to think about that raised fifth degree in the major scale, that's equivalent to the to the leading tone in the relative minor. Right. So if, let's say if you're in the key of C and you're going C, D, E, F, G, G sharp, A, B, C, the G sharp is is the seventh of A minor. 
So you can think of that as the relative minor with the uh, with the harmonic minor in it. So so if you want to think about that relationship, that's kind of built into the Bop scale. Now he doesn't call it a Bop scale because uh, it doesn't tell you anything about the origin of it. The origin of it is from a six chord and a diminished chord, a C six, C E G, and a and a diminished chord D F. You said we were getting technical, right? We are. We have to be. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> so the D F um, A flat and B, right? So when you put those two scales together, you end up with that eight note scale C D E F G A flat or G sharp A B and C, and that's what people call the major bop scale. The problem is though, it doesn't apply to different things. So actually, what ends up happening is he he builds it, and this. Uh, again, this goes to other concepts of his. Like he has this way of looking at diminished scales, how everything comes from diminished, and I call it the diminished genealogy. That's my name for it. <laughs> but he'll say so and so, you know, like so and so begat so and so who begat so and so. So this is how he came up with these diminished scales, and we'll talk about that. But but just to answer your question, he's got four different scales based on four different chords: the major six the minor six, the dominant seventh, and the dominant seventh with a flat five. Each one of them shares the same diminished note. Is that used in, as a scale outline, or is that used more for theory and harmony? That's used for theory and harmony. The scale outline, you can use those scales, but the, what he uses in improv class is a different language of how to build lines and how to improvise interesting lines. And then what he'll do is he'll take the natural scale and then he'll throw half steps in. He has his half step rules. So for so based on if you start your line on the root third fifth or seventh, there's a specific set of rules of how many half steps fit in the line and where to put those half steps. And then there's a rule for the second, fourth, and sixth. And then you and then there's a rule for the major. There's a rule for the dominant. And a rule for the minor. Now you said he breaks it up with arpeggios and chords and uh, right. Because you don't just play scales, you play interesting lines, interesting shapes. How much material are we talking about here in terms of line building? Well, you know, this is the, actually goes back to your other question about the difference in the approach in teaching a, in, a, in a school such as, in a conservatory such as Berkeley or New School or whatever, as opposed to Barry's method. Uh, Barry takes a very holistic view of it. So you could say uh, he is like the Einstein of bebop. If Einstein... <laughs> Einstein narrowed down gravity and time and space into one simple principle, right? Which he called relativity, right? Now, I'm not a physicist. I'm definitely out of my league. But, you, but, but the, the, it's a sensibility of being able to narrow things down to their essence and to come up with a simple principle that then applies to endless possibilities. Well, he did that with Bebop. So when you come to Barry's class and when you read, you know, material published by Barry aficionados or when you talk to people who understand Barry's method or you keep showing up to class, you know, it's a little bit like fishing, you know, like you, you, you show up to the pond, you might catch a big fish one day or you might not catch any fish the next day. And some days you'll catch a fish and it'll feed your family for a month. But you got to keep showing up to the pond. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the way class is structured. But if you keep showing up, what ends up happening is eventually the picture sort of crystallizes into – it boils down to really a handful of principles, under 10. You know, I'm going to say – I can't really name exactly how many because then every time I think of one, I'll think of another one. But it's definitely under ten. Let's hear him. Principles. So, so okay. So you've got the whole scale of chords idea or scalar chords, where you would, um, and I guess that would intersect with Partimento study where Ooh, uh, like a seven six. That's <laughs> that's right. We talked about this. Uh, well, this is new to me now. I'm just starting to see this. Okay, now, but, but let's let's really let's see. leave Partimento to the later part of the conversation. Let's let's get back to Barry for now. Well, he does this seven six suspension. Well, he'll call a scale of chords with movement, and then he'll add different embellishments to it, to half step embellishments to it, and then so and he'll do it in different ways, and then that there's that whole thing scale of chords. Then you've got a whole uh, this the whole six diminished idea. Um, where you integrate a diminished chord into a, a six chord, and then you end up with that eight 
with those four eight note scales, major six, minor six, dominant seven, and dominant seven flat five diminished, and everything associated with that. So different ways of voicing it: drop two, drop three, drop two and four, three note voicings, uh, how to borrow notes from diminished, and there's a whole subset of things. So that's another principle. The other another principle would be what you would call the major chromatic. Now the thing is, everything. See the way I like to teach it to my students is like, oh, you got this map of this country, Barry Harristan, okay, <laughs> and then there are different cities in Barry Harristan, and there are highways connecting all of these cities. Everyone connects to so the citizens of you know of scale of chords town can go visit drop twoville and drop twoville can go to you know to you know six you know the six diminished chordville you know what i mean and then there's and then there's the there's the six chord rules there's the half step rules yeah you know it, it does it does remind me a lot you mentioned partimento it really is a lot like partimento because in partimento there's so many things to kind of put together to get together well it's it's a it's a construction kit it's a construction. It's like chess moves that come together. Uh, it's Legos, whatever you. It's block playing with blocks, it, and and that's what it is. Music is a language, so you you learn the elements of the language, and you learn how to piece them together in in more and more uh, uh, creative ways. Um, and that's that's what's so engaging about it is that it's not this this sort of rote learning method. It's more of a exploration and a building. Well, you said that Barry codified this language. Now, are you able to listen to the Bud and Dizzy and Charlie Parker recordings and actually break them down systematically? Uh, well, I'm not as big of a scholar in the repertoire as some of other Barry's disciples are, although I'm working on it, maybe a little late in the game. But, but I can definitely hear where Barry stole his stuff from. You know, like I was like, oh, when you listen to this recording of Bud Powell, and then you hear some move that he did, and you can say, oh, well, that's what that's what he took when he did that. But what Barry would do is he would take that move that Bud did, and he would develop it further, and do his own thing with it. That's that's the key. And he even says this in class. He says, now you take this idea. Now you have to do something with it. That was a criticism that people who are not familiar with Barry, they'll say, ah, oh, he's a Bud Powell clone. No, he's not a clone. He uses the, the mechanics of the language that Bud Powell, I mean, I think everybody can agree that between Bud and Bird and Dizzy, they invented the language of bebop, right? And, uh, and you know, and uh, John Lewis, and I mean, there's others, obviously, right? But Barry focused in on Bud and and bird and he took their ideas and he made them their own and he started to develop on them so it's like a, a scholar following another scholar that's all it is i mean if you're going to criticize that then you know you <laughs> criticize beethoven and mozart yeah. right right you know exactly <laughs> criticize uh, uh criticize any any physician that builds on the work of previous position <laughs> right right you know <laughs> okay so now what is this thing about four dominant scales that are related so like there's a diminished but out of that you can have four dominants is that okay. right okay so all right so you want to get into the diminished genealogy yes town yes in the country of barry harris right. <laughs> so so let's take a travel down to to diminished genealogy town so the way he tells it it's a beautiful story it's almost biblical he says okay so first there was 12 right that's the chromatic scale and that's god that's the 12 zodiac signs that's the 12 disciples that's everything is 12 right and then god made man and woman right so you had two and what are the two it's the two whole tone scales from c to b you have two whole tone scales right and then the two what do man and woman do when they get together and then somebody in class will say they argue <laughs> and then after they argue, they get together and they make babies, right? And then so they made baby. They made three babies, and those are the three diminished seventh chords. So there are three of them between C and B, and in, in, in the twelve tones of the twelve twelve tone scale. So and then he'll do a thing where he'll show, well, I can turn any whole tone scale into any diminished chord. 
and he'll give you an example of how he can do a, a nice progression, a two five one progression, in a song, and he'll create a sequence from it, and he'll do he'll hold down the whole six tones of a of a whole tone scale, and go to a diminished, which itself can be a dominant, like a dominant with a flat nine, and move to another chord and it's just a beautiful sound so he says so like they're all related so any any whole tone can go to any of the three diminished linearly so that's the next level in terms of improvisation you're talking about uh, harmony more now but actually improvisation includes harmony as well as melody so you could do this uh, uh, melodically as well uh it really is again a principle it's an operating principle you know, so you can apply it to any any musical situation as needed. When you have the diminished chords, and, and I know that if you alter each one of the notes, you could get a dominant chord. Now, what? how yeah. do those dominant... Well, that's the next level. Okay, go ahead. That's exactly the next level. So he says, so now you got your three diminished. And he says, he'll say, Schoenberg said, if I move this one note down, I get a dominant. And then I can move each one and I get a dominant. But then Barry's like, well, what if I move it up? What happens if I take... A C sharp diminished, for example, C sharp, E, G, and uh, B flat. And I move the C sharp up. What do I get? I get D, E, G, and B flat. Well, that, isn't that a G minor six? So he says, if I move one down, I get dominant seven, right? But if I move it up, I get a minor six chord. All right? Okay. Well, what if I move two consecutive chord tones down? It's okay, let me just look at that C sharp diminished. Uh, C sharp and the E moves down to a C and E flat. I end up with C, E flat, G, B flat. Wait a minute. Isn't that, a, isn't that an E flat six? Major six? Well, mm. by golly, it is. <laughs> so if I move two, now I get a major six chord. What happens if I move them up? Well, okay, so the C sharp becomes a D and the E becomes an F. Wait, it's a B flat six. So wait a minute, if I move them down, I get one six chord, and if I move them up, I get a six chord that's a fifth away. Hmm. So this is how his mind works. He's just so brilliant that way. He's able to really get in because he's not handcuffed by traditional teaching. He's free to sit there and, and figure this stuff out. So he says, so now, so now what happened? We had two diminished chords, right? We moved, we were using two different diminished chords because we're moving it by half steps. So by definition, we're using two different diminished chords, right? So the, the major, the dominant seven, it uses one note from one diminished and three from another. The minor six uses one, three from another. The major six uses two from one and two from the other. He says, what if I move two non-consecutive ones? What if I move the C sharp and the G? Well, I end up with a C dominant seven with a flat five. So in other words, I was able to construct a major six, a minor six, a dominant seven, and a dominant seven flat five, all from moving chord tones from one diminished scale, which is equivalent to using two diminished, uh, one diminished chord, which is equivalent to using two diminished chords, right? Well, there are three diminished chords, right? Where's the third one? Well, the third one is the one you move through. The third one is where the scale tones come from. And that's how he came up with that. It's brilliant. You have these chords that come out of the diminished chord by a little bit of alteration. So what does that mean practically? How would you use them now? Uh, well, so then they, then they are now the origin of these four scales. So, you, you know, like the, the six diminished, the seven, the, the, the six diminished, the minor six diminished, the seven diminished, and the seven flat five diminished. Because the, the six chord comes from two out of the three diminished scales, and the diminished that's attached to that is the third diminished. So if you take a C6 and you say a C6 is C, E, G, and A, right? The C and the A come from a C diminished chord, and the E and the G come from a C sharp diminished chord. Where's the D diminished? Well, that's the diminished that you move through. And you end up with C, D, E, F, G, G sharp, A, B, and C. And, and that's how that came into being. And that's the origin story, if you will, of, the, of those four scales. Now, when you think about the bebop scale, as it were, when they say a, a dominant bebop scale, they'll go, it's, it's da -na 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 -na, which is C, B, B flat, A, G, you know, so, and so on, where you put a half step. That's not the way the seven diminished scale works. It's a different scale. If you think about the seven diminished scale, Nobody teaches this. It's like 
it's a C7 and a D diminished, right? So a C7 is C, E, G, and B flat. A D diminishes D, F, A flat, and B. So when you put them together, you get a scale that's C, D, E, F, G, A flat, B flat, B, C. It's a great scale, but it's not what you would call the, the bop scale, the dominant bop scale. In Barry's world, the dominant bop scale is, is a dominant scale with the half step between the root and the seventh. It's a, that goes to the half step rules. That's another town in Barry Harris tan. <laughs> right? Wait, wait, wait. Isaac, I got to stop you here. So uh, now we're in Harmony Central. We're in Harmony Central, right? We're talking about chords and comp. We're Harmony Central. Okay, so let's say you have two bars of a dominant chord. Is that where you throw in the dominant diminished uh, scale of chords? You might. You might. That's one option. You might. I would, I would probably use it in a chording, uh, like a, an accompaniment, a comping. Like I might, I might throw that. Let's say I've I've got a C7 for two measures. I might throw the C7 to the D diminished to the inversion of the C7, and I'll get this da 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 this nice movement sound while I'm comping. I might use that scale. What I what I'm probably more apt to do is to use the half step rules when I'm when I'm coming up with lines on it, because there are different ways of of adding half steps at judicious points to to create interesting lines while you're improvising and uh and again that's that's melody central i guess you know which is a related but different so okay you have these beautiful let's say somebody's really practiced these four scale of chords and and as many keys as they can how do you use them now well um you use them in uh um you use them in chording like you you there's so many ways of using them if once you see it's kind of like it's kind of it boils down harmony as a whole into tonic and dominant areas and and then you see it as one unit with two sides like a yin and yang thing okay and when you're in a playing situation you see that whole framework. So then the minutia of what chord leads to what or which chord tone leads to what isn't as important. You're just going to say, I'm going to use some notes from the diminution. I'm going to use some notes from the chord tones and borrow them and put them together and mix them and match them in different ways. That's how you look at it really much more holistically than an approach that we were des describing earlier from these schools that shall not be named, where you're like, oh, well, the, which chord tone to use or which tension do you use? And then you're going one by one. Instead of going one by one, now you see the whole framework and it's right there in front of you and you just move move the pieces around can, like can a we checkerboard. Take, can we take an example? So like Cherokee, for instance. Uh, let's slow it down. So yeah. I know it's a very fast tune, but... It's actually really nice as a ballad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is this a B-flat or a B-flat major 7? How would you comp That's that? Right. Well, so now we're getting a little bit into another another town in, in Harmony Central. Let's call it one of the suburbs of Har Harmony Central in Barry Harris 10. And that, that's his six chord rules, which I was going to post... That was going to be my next video, oh, but then your your YouTube channel. Then, I'm such a fan of it. You all 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 two videos of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a distillation of the knowledge from those workshops. It's fantastic. I really yeah. encourage people to, well, to subscribe gonna, to gonna, that. One by one, one by one. I'm <laughs> okay, get so to we're now in them. the suburb of Harmonyville. So what, what's happening? Yeah, six chords. So that's the, his six chord rules. He's got eight ways of of throwing a six chord on top of another chord tone. So uh, I might play an F six on that B flat major because the F6 gives me F, A, C, and D. F is the fifth of B flat, A is the major seventh, C is the ninth, and D is the third. And that gives you a really beautiful sound. But here's the kicker. I can use the diminished of F, right? And um, I can use the diminished of F. So think about using that in a B flat major and what kind of cool sounds you can get, right? Because they resolve themselves linearly into F. And this is, this is the power of this stuff. You'd never, you would never say in that other framework, 
I'm going to play an F major seven with a nine, but then I'm going to throw in, I uh, sorry, B flat major seven with a nine, but then how do you explain a, a C sharp? Uh, well, how does well? Guess what, man? It sounds awesome, and that's there's your modernism. There's your modernism. When you can start, you, you can take a C sharp as, and you can make a, you can actually make a A triad with that on top of a of a B flat major, and resolve the A triad to a like a D minor. And now there's your Herbie, there's your McCoy, there's your Chick. All right, right there in that six diminished scale, but you've used a, a six chord rule. You know what I'm saying? It's right there. All the modernism is woven into it. You just got to know how to find it. So you can you can pretty much handle any chord situation by thinking of them in six chords, and and then also these four chord scales. Would you say that's also for, that's for accompaniment or for you're making your own solo composition? Uh, it's, it's for it's for basically harmony in general. All of it, all of it. That's right. It's a framework. It's a uh, it's an operating principle and. Uh, you know, it's E equals MC squared of of jazz. Can right? I? Okay, now I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Uh, and you don't have to answer if you don't feel comfortable. <laughs> I want to get, you've been in those classes for a long time. I'm sure he must have dropped a lot of comments about players, about things and that here and there. You must have dropped a little something here and there. I would really like to know what he thought about like the like the Sonny Clarks, the Bobby Timmons, you know, the, the hard bop pianists that came after the Bud Powell and, and you know, that kind of thing. Well, uh, when, it, when he starts talking about that stuff, that's when I check my phone. <laughs> so I don't really hear a lot of it. <laughs> no, so, you know, so here, here's the thing. I mean, uh, you know, I actually was very lucky to be in the audience uh, when Barry Harris and uh, Cedar Walton did a double piano trio concert. And it was just so cool to watch their interactions. I mean, the, the bottom line is, even though he does like to, he likes to, he likes to throw things out there. But I, I, but I think that really, in truth, it's all, it's, it's all in, in good spirit of collegiality. And, and he just believes in, it, he just believes in, the bebop language being the most elegant representation of the music. You know, and he <laughs> advocates for that. You know what's you know? funny? I've only been there once. It was last December. I loved it. And I saw you there, but we, we weren't friends yet. But I remember right. there was one I moment. Remember, I remember. I would remember what is one moment. He turned around and gave a really ugly look at some guy with his keyboard. And then he, he then a, a second later, he turned back and gave him a little wink and a smile to tell him it was all a That's joke. Right. It was <laughs> exactly right. He loves to do that. He is a master like I've never really actually seen this before because of the circles that I grew up in and travel in and but when I finally came to Barry I real I got an exposure of really what it is because he is a master of the old school jive. <laughs> <laughs> he really he is a master of it and it's just it's a lot of fun. You Can know? you comment on his big band writing and he's doing he's doing now a uh, big pieces right big projects so can you talk about i think you're running some rehearsals for him as well well uh i he sometimes he asks me to uh help uh, teach parts to the chorus or conduct them when when uh I'd be one of the people that does it because he does have a a wide circle of people that that helps him out with that um well the big band thing is kind of amazing he like 50 years ago we're talking a long time ago he just sat down without a lick of formal training in arranging or orchestration. And he sat down and he wrote these arrangements for big band, strings, and chorus of his originals and of standards. And they were basically just sitting in his closet there. And, and I was there actually one day where it was – we're playing Scrabble. And he says, Isaac, look here. Go into that closet. He had just come off of a back injury, which is another thing about him. 
here's a here's a man. He's eighty eight years old now. He's eighty nine years old. He's turning ninety in in December, and the man slips and falls. You know, fractures two vertebrae, and you know, and and he makes Rocky look like a sissy. <laughs> I mean, he like came out of that man, <laughs> and he come walks up the stairs. In the, in the house, you know, he lives in Nika's house, you know. And anyway, look here. He so he couldn't move, so he's having me go. Look here, get get that. And and in this closet are piles of sheet music that have been sitting there, you know, since I was, you know, I, I, you know, in grade school. <laughs> so he's been writing and writing all this music? Well, he did for a while, and he has this whole thing. And so Michael Weiss and other people have been helping him put the, um, you know, uh, you know, a lot, a lot, you know, some of his longtime disciples and, and colleagues have been helping him put together uh, this repertoire. And he just decided one day, he says, I want to hear my music. That was it. So he goes and he rents out an orchestral rehearsal studio, which is not cheap. And, uh, and calling all musicians, play my music. And lo and behold, there they are. And so now I had, I have to work and I did, I couldn't make it. But when I, when I finally made it there and I heard these things played, my jaw was like hit the floor because it's like, what you hear, I, I guess the word that comes to mind is authentic, you know. And I did, I, like I said, I studied jazz comp, and I, and, you know, and I studied with with Herb and all these great teachers, and I, and I get this whole writing thing, you know, or thought I did. And when you see Barry, and again, what drove him was pure obstinance. I hear this stuff. I'm writing it down. I don't care what you think. Sheer obstinance. And it's amazing. It's amazing. It's it's so beautiful. And right. You know, yeah, I mean, correct. it's his mother tongue. It's his mother tongue. And and you hear it. It's the authenticity in every measure. It's uh, it's remarkable. And, uh, you know, another another. When I was in Italy with him, I went to Italy to the Italy workshop, which is another thing I really recommend anybody listening to, to make the pilgrimage. The energy, you, you get 20 plus countries, people from 20 plus countries coming in there, really getting into it. The, the energy is so palpable. And uh, one of his uh, 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 teachers that, that, that uh, lives in Switzerland now, Fitz Benedetti, who's phenomenal, uh, uh, pianist and teacher, he said it best. He said, you know, there is no substitution for direct exposure. And that's it. He is it. He is the real deal, you know. And there's there's really no describing the the ancillary benefits that you get just from being in the room and and seeing him do his jive thing. And you know what I mean? I want to ask you one final question before we end off, which is yeah. um if somebody wants to get good at jazz, you know, there's so many methods, there's so many people teaching different styles and different things online. You have had, you've gone through Berkeley, you've studied with Barry, you've really, you've done a master's of education. How should someone who's just brand new to this really approach jazz and what's the right attitude to take to this? Okay, so that's an excellent question because, again, there's, there's kind of two schools of thought here. There's the academics school of thought, where you would go to a school and you would learn all the theory and everything. Um, but I think that one is better served by learning it how it's meant to be learned, I think, which is as an oral tradition. You know, seek out mentors whose playing you like, either electronically on YouTube or in person, which is best, and, and learn from them. And by and learning from them means sometimes just hanging out and playing Scrabble. I mean, music is a language, so it has to say stuff, and that stuff is basic humanity. And that's how you're going to get depth and you know breadth into your artistic expression. 
the and now the technical stuff you need to know the technical stuff you need to know all your scales you need to know what a dominant is you need to know what you know but that's not rocket science that's simple stuff you can find basic theory everywhere but seek out your mentors go to them transcribe their solos or transcribe four measures of their solos of the part that you like take it through the keys that's how you're going to get good when you go to study a language you study the language right you study how to conjugate verbs and you study how to what nouns are and you build a larger vocab larger and larger vocabulary but how do you learn to speak the language you go to the country you listen to other people speaking it correctly that's how you learn to speak a language so i would say the same way approach learning jazz the same way wonderful well the great isaac raz subscribe to his youtube channel check him out whole music llc uh, he's going to have a lot more videos and i really i would love for you to come back on again because we did touch on barry but i feel like it's such a vast ocean of material there that it really is <laughs> that it's, i don't think one scratch the surface i could go on it's, I had a great time. I really enjoyed it. I don't it. think one hour is enough, me. Isaac. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan of your playing. And I, I think really, I mean, if I'm just being honest, there are a lot of people who teach on YouTube. And I don't know, and just my opinion, I don't agree with a lot of what they say. And I think you're, you're re you really know your stuff very well. Well, you're very kind. And I, I really appreciate your, uh, your endorsement and your... Uh, uh, um, you know, we, we teach each other. I, I learn a lot from you. And by as the way, well, so quick I, comment before yeah. you go on what on what you think of Partimento, which you have mentioned you just learned about. Oh my goodness! Okay, so let's take let's go back to the physics analogy, right? So I thought I discovered the atom, and I'm like, yeah, this is so cool because that was the research that I did. But then I realized there are quarks, and you're like, wow. It's not. It doesn't stop there. There's a there's a subatomic particle that makes everything work. And then maybe there are strings that make these quarks work. Well, partimento is that. That's partimento. Partimento is like the string theory of music, you know. <laughs> and and uh, and it's it just makes the hairs on the back of my head on my neck stand up to think when I'm reading through the Fenaroli book. You know, it's one thing when you're when you're studying a Bach piece from the Well-Tempered Clavier, right? And you're and you're you're having a conversation with him with this man, and and he's showing you this is so cool, this is so cool, and you're like, yeah, but it's a one-way conversation because it's a written piece. When I'm reading through Fenaroli or Ferno or or Durante or any of those, and you they're they their partimenti are written as teaching pieces, so you see the same situation come up in different permutations, and there's a sort of an unspoken Okay, Padawan, here's how they do it in here, and here's how you do it here. You know, it's like the, and you're having a conversation with a man who lived 250 years ago. That just, that just gives me goosebumps. Just to tie this to Barry Harris, we know a mutually brilliant little girl who went to his, to his workshop, and Barry is quite impressed by this Partimento business, right? Yes, yes. Um, uh, and, and there is definitely, this is what's so sort of creepy and amazing <laughs> about it is that it's the way Barry teaches it is exactly the way these part of it, apparently, you know, based on my, what I've read. And, and I guess you would, you would know too, having, having uh, had on your show, some of the, some of the giants of the field um, that, that, that this is how they taught it in the conservatories of Naples in the, in the early, uh, early to mid 17th century. And eventually century or exported late. to everywhere. 18th century, early, early to mid 18th century, and exported it to e everywhere, right? And then there was that whole Napoleon thing, and you know, the, the, and I'm just learning about this. But but when when you look at this at this idea of teaching musical language in terms of schema, and in terms of building blocks, and in and learning these schema by building core concepts such as the rule of the octave which you could think of the scale of chords barry's style being the rule of the octave you know and you can think of the six diminished scale as being you know uh, uh, one of one of the standard schema again i'm not fluent enough in the language yet to be able to make these comparisons but that's where i'm starting to really direct my attention is how to find the bridge between you know, 
1750 and 1950. <laughs> and you know what? You would be the, a perfect guy to look at that because you really know the Barry Harris stuff so well. And you, with your eyes looking at Parlamento, it would be really wonderful to see the parallels. Well, stay tuned. The great stay Isaac tuned. Rez. Subscribe to his channel. He's a wonderful <laughs> teacher, great musician. Isaac, I hope you had a great time on the show. I'll talk to you soon. I did. I had a blast. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of my guests. They are the best in the business. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you shared it on social media and hit subscribe for future guests. Check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and check out SongbirdMusicAcademy.com for free resources on how to learn music. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 